happy with his legal team and looking uh, to add a veteran Washington lawyer amid apparent concerns that, as the Times put it, the investigation is unlikely to end anytime soon. But the president denying that tweeting, quote, the failing New York Times pro proposedly wrote, uh, purposely wrote a false story stating that I'm unhappy with my legal team on the Russia case and am going to add another lawyer to help out. Wrong. I am very happy with my lawyers, John Dowd, Ty Cobb, and Jay Seculo. They are doing a great job and have shown conclusively that there was no collusion with Russia. Just excuse, uh, just excuse for losing. The only collusion was that done by the DNC, the Democrats, and crooked Hillary. The writer of the story, Maggie Haberman, a Hillary flunky, knows nothing about me and is not given access. Meantime, former Trump campaign aide Stan Nunberg, after earlier threatening to defy Mueller, now singing a different tune about the probe after his grand jury testimony. Nunberg telling ABC News, quote, no, I don't think it's a witch hunt. There's a lot there there, and that's the sad truth. I don't believe it leads to the precedent. Nunberg says he never personally worked with anyone who was unethical, including his boss and mentor, former campaign aide Roger Stone who has denied any wrongdoing. But Nunberg says he is, quote, very worried about Stone. Pardon my, my cold. It's a, you know, it's, it's a challenging day for me on this Monday morning. Um, Corey, what do, you, what do you make of all the latest developments here and, and certainly seeing that this is, this is not over? Well, I don't think the Mueller investigation is going to wrap up anytime soon. And I think what the president has said and what his team has said is they've been willing and able to cooperate on everything that the Mueller team has asked for. They've turned over emails. They've made people available. Uh, you know, the Mueller team has investigated or sat down with 14, 15, 20 people that have worked either currently or have worked in the White House. So that shows a level of cooperation, mm -hmm. which is unprecedented. But I do think what has been clear from everybody was that there was no collusion here. And if Bob Mueller wants to find out, was there any collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia? There was none. That's been unequivocal. Now, if people lie to the Mueller investigators, they should be held accountable for that. And we've seen the individuals who have lied to them over a number of things are being held accountable for that. And that's perfectly fine. And I'm sure the president's OK with that. But you have to bring this to a conclusion, and that needs to be done soon to show that the president okay. didn't do Is anything wrong. Is there any truth, though, that he's unhappy with his legal team? I think he's been very happy with his legal team. I haven't spoken to the president about it, but I think he's very happy so far. Okay, what about some of the people who have been so problematic from early on in the campaign, like Sam Nunberg? You know, it has been utterly bizarre watching him make the rounds, and I, I really feel that he was having a psychotic break, and CNN and MSNBC <laughs> were taking advantage of that. And I, I thought in, in a lot of ways it was almost pornographic. It was, it was very disturbing to watch, but Nunberg won't stop. And he's, he keeps saying there is a there there. And it, the president's inner circle has committed some sort of political atrocity. What is he referring to? Well, look, Sam Nunberg, I fired him on two separate occasions. He was mm -hmm. fired three times ultimately by the Trump organization. I fired Sam finally for the last time in August of 2015, so shortly after the campaign had launched. Yeah. So Sam has no access to information of anything that took place other than what's been out in the public mindset. Uh, but that being said, Look, there is no there there. I sat there with candidate Trump from before he ever came down that escalator all the way through June of 2016. And we never met with Russians. We never spoke to Russians. We never interacted with Russians. There was no collusion. And what I've said was, if anybody tried to materially impact the outcome of this election, they should go to jail for the rest of their lives. Yeah. That's what they should do. But what Sam is talking about, nobody knows. And I think it's a sad episode if you look at what took place with Sam Nunberg on television last week. Mm -hmm. I think it was last Monday and Tuesday. Clearly. Uh, there is some type of issue there that needs to be addressed, and I think that probably needs some professional Why did you fire yourself. him three times? Look, we fired him the last time because of the racist tweets that he had on his Facebook page that were uh, that racist posts on his Facebook page. Mm -hmm. it, there was no place for that in the campaign. How do you keep coming back? Look, some of that predated <laughs> me, I'll tell you. Um, but, but Sam clearly has some issues that he needs to address from what he said. I thought yeah. he said was he was going to testify in front of the grand but, jury. But why did the campaign help. allow people like that and George Papadopoulos and Paul Manafort? I mean, these are clearly compromised individuals. How did they get through that process? Well, uh, to be fair, there wasn't a deep vetting process during the campaign, and it wasn't uh, that a whole bunch of people at the onset of the campaign were looking to join us. Sam was there prior to me coming onto the campaign. Uh, I spent some time with Sam, realized he wasn't the right type of person that we want to have in the campaign. We fired him, he came back, we fired him again. It's kind of like a bad penny just keeps showing up. Um, <laughs> and, and so, look, you know, I, I'll take some responsibility for it, but by August of 15, when we knew Donald Trump was in first place and was going to be the Republican nominee or on his path to that, yeah. we knew there was no place in the campaign. Meanwhile, 
Sarah, you sat down for hours of questioning last week. How many to be exact? 12 hours of that I'll never oh. get back from my second life. Time? Second time. And, and we were yeah. told that you, after that meeting was over, that you wouldn't answer some questions because they were, were not relevant uh, to the investigation. Well, here's what I said. And I look, the congressmen who, uh, who are doing this on the minority side are very dishonest guys. I sat there and said, I will sit here all day and answer every Which question you, you want. <laughs> and I said, ask me a question about Russia. Ask me a question about collusion. Ask me about anything that has to do with my time on the campaign. Don't ask me what I had for breakfast yesterday because it's not relevant. You can ask me if I had anything Russian for breakfast yesterday. I'll be happy to answer that question, which I didn't. But I sat there and answered dozen, a dozen hours of questioning. Okay? Then they started asking me about things that took place two months after the election happened. I said, look, I don't have anything to do with this. It had nothing to do with the outcome of the election. If you're asking me what took place in January or February of 2017, I have no idea. They were useless questions. Can, can I ask one last question? Because I know you spent, I think, eight hours the first time, 12 hours the second time. That's almost a complete day. Yet you hear Democrats talking about the fact that they may want to subpoena some people that they've already talked with. Is there any thought going forward? Because you said, you know, we don't know when the Mueller investigation is going to end, but we know it's not going to be immediate. Uh, I'm paraphrasing you from just a moment ago. Is there any reason why they would subpoena to bring you back that you know? Look, I don't think so. I think I've answered all of their questions. I volunteered on two separate occasions to go there and spend time in front of the committee to demonstrate there was no collusion, there was no cooperation, there was no coordination. I've been very clear. I could have done the whole interview in 30 seconds. No collusion, no cooperation, no coordination, no Russians, end of the interview. And here's what okay? I had for breakfast. And that's it. And I had the interview. I had for breakfast. I had a French toast, right? Which is French, not Russian. Okay? I don't have Russian Freedom toast. Freedom toast. <laughs> Freedom toast. All right, Corey, thank you. President Trump reigniting his feud with the media over the weekend after appearing to make peace with the press just last week. Why some say his latest comments went too far. Plus, President Trump sounding upbeat about his invitation from North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un to meet face to face, but not everyone in the mainstream media feels the same way, whether the criticism is warranted or just plain partisan politics. I think they want to make peace. I think it's time. And I think we've shown great strength. I think that's also important. The South Korean representatives who just left North Korea came outside big throng of press. They announced that North Korea, Kim Jong-un, would like to meet with President Trump. We've been very strong and very vigilant. And now lots of good things I think are going to happen, but we'll see. I think they want to make peace. I think it's time. And I think we've shown great strength. I think that's also important. The president sounding optimistic about his invitation from North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un to meet in person. The when, the where, still to be determined, but the move would mark the first face-to-face -face encounter between leaders of the two nations in history. CIA Director Mike Pompeo says he's hopeful the talks can mark a breakthrough with North Korea. This administration came in, the president talked about it in his campaign and put enormous pressure on the North Korean economy and on the North Korean leadership. Uh, that gave us this opportunity where Kim Jong-un now has committed to stopping nuclear testing, stopping missile tests, uh, allowing exercises to go forward, something that's been incredibly contentious in the past, uh, and at the same time saying that denuclearization, complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization is a topic for discussion, but make no mistake about it, while these negotiations are going on, there will be no concessions made. So experts saying that they're positive, but the entire panel on NBC's Meet the Press painted so the top diplomat for our nation right now. Rex Tillerson is in on the African continent right now. He's in Nigeria. Uh, he just was telling Reuters that um, the U.S. has not heard anything back from North Korea, but expects to hear something directly from them soon. Well, I think they will, and uh, North Korea has traditionally been fairly slow to respond in the public format on these things. But they've used their emissaries through South Korea to make the request to the president. He accepted immediately. And what's astonishing to me is for 30 years, the geniuses that we just saw on NBC <laughs> told us that everything was going to go great with North Korea. But what we've seen is the nuclearization of North Korea. Right? Don't forget, we gave North Korea $4 billion to make sure they didn't nuclearize about 30 years ago, and here they are testing weapons all the time. And what we've done for the first time, for the first time in our lifetime, is the president has said, I'm willing to sit down and meet with you on one condition and one condition only. 
You stop testing nuclear weapons. You know what that means? If you live in South Korea, you live in Guam, you live in Hawaii, you can sleep a little safer at night knowing that Kim Jong-un is not going to launch an attack until at least he spends time meeting with the president. Why is that not being hailed as an opportunity and an ability to save people's lives? That's what we should be looking at you right know, now. It's interesting, uh, Kennedy, because the last time that anything even approached this was Madeleine Albright. Yeah. She went over to North Korea, sat for six Took hours. Took that trying Michael to Jordan basket. Well, really Kim worked Jung too. Un, uh's dad ill. <laughs> some of these same things, and it was such a failure that it turned out to be an embarrassment for this country. So that was under the Clinton administration. So I, I can understand why maybe some of those people sitting yeah. around the table might not understand somebody with that a different was, vision. That was three administrations ago, and exactly. what we've learned is you can't necessarily trust North Korea when they say they're coming to the table, and that's why the president has been using unpredictability in a way that you know. Now, I may not agree with him on tariffs. I may not agree with him on infrastructure and a number of other things. But here, I actually think he's created an advantage for the United States. And I think the unpredictability and the good cop, bad cop with Tillerson, I think it actually could work. And I think that people at NBC better hope that it works. And they better pray to God that we have peace on the Korean Peninsula. And this just might do it. Because you have a president, he's unorthodox, but he can get in a room and he can read people. And if he looks eye to eye with this leader and actually gets something done, that is a, that's a positive, not just for the United States, but for the world. There are three things every president wants. They want to tame Russia, they want peace in the Middle East, and they want to neutralize North Korea. Is that what Barack Obama wanted? They all, uh, he paid lip service to quite a few things. Very florid speaker. That being said, <laughs> Corey, uh, knowing this president so intimately for, during your time um, heading up his campaign, ha how has his strategy and his plans, if elected president at that time, how has his strategy evolved now? through his presidency, would you say? Well, look, as it relates to North Korea specifically, they've put massive amounts of economic sanctions on North Korea, which has really stymied that economy. He's gone to countries like China and Russia and said, let's work together to impose those economic sanctions. And clearly they've worked because North Korea is not doing well economically. And so what this president said, first we start with economic sanctions, now we're going to sit down and have a negotiation. I understand the historic nature of the President of the United States sitting down with the leader of North Korea. It has never been done before. But our policy towards North Korea has failed. Is this meeting a result of those sanctions? Th this meeting is a result of Donald Trump saying we need to do things differently because the people at Foggy Bottom, where the State Department is for the last 30 years, have failed our country. So some, like Ambassador John Bolton, formerly of the UN and on this channel quite often, has said that it was actually the promise of military might behind the diplomacy and the economic sa sanctions. Because we had 25 years of economic sanctions. Real quick, mm -hmm. last thought. Uh, economic sanctions, they can work. They do work. I think uh, the president also worked aggressively with China, put a little pressure on China. Maybe the steel tariffs relate back to all of that to get China to pressure North Korea as well. This is a very optimistic sign. I was happy on Friday. That plus 313,000 jobs added to the economy. <laughs> Kim right. Jong-un is terrified better, right? of the military consequences. It, behind the kind yeah. of the layering there. All right. Uh, most first-term presidents face no opposition for renomination, but GOP Senator Jeff Flake says someone should challenge President Trump in 2020. Could that happen? And would it hurt or help the GOP? And Democrat Senator Elizabeth Warren pressed on whether she will run in 2020, and her claim of Native American heritage, an issue sure to dog her in any campaign, ahead her response to a point-blank question from our own John Roberts. Stay close. Would you be willing to take a DNA test to, to put this issue to rest? Tremendous for the sport, and uh, it's really a reminder why baseball is our national pastime. Thank you to the Energy Secretary, Rick Perry. And he, we love Rick, right? Did I do the right job with Rick? I think we did the right job, right, John? There's John Cornyn, too. You know John, your great senator. And is that Ted Cruz? That's Ted Cruz right there. We have well represented. You're well represented today. But uh, I do want to thank Senator Cornyn, Senator Cruz, Representative Kevin Brady. Where's Kevin? Where's Kevin? Kevin, are we going for an additional tax cut, I understand? Uh, he's the king of those tax cuts, yeah. We're going to do a phase two. I'm hearing that. You hear that, John and Ted? Phase two. 
We're actually very serious about that, Kevin. So it's good. But Kevin Brady is a spectacular person and did a really incredible job with the tax cuts. And to all of the members of the Texas congressional delegation, thank you very much. A delegation of great people. Thank you all for being here. It's a big delegation. You all show up for the Houston Astros, don't you, huh? That's great. To Jim Crane, General Manager Jeff Lunau, President Reed Ryan, Skipper A.J. Hinch, become very famous. A.J., you become very famous, I have to tell you. That was a great job of skippering. <laughs> and to all of the players and staff, congratulations on your incredible victory. It was indeed. After the devastating Hurricane Harvey, incredible that uh, what, with what you went through, that you're the champions with what you went through with Harvey. It was a, it's a really befitting tribute. What was really a show of uh, world spirit and uh, Houston strong. You were Houston strong. I also want to thank some of the heroes of Hurricane Harvey who join us today, including members of the incredible Cajun Navy. Right here, these guys. Right. Right, John, thank you. John. We have John Bridgers. We have Ben Husser. Reverend Lewis Husser, he said he was praying for me. That's good. Thank you. That's always nice. That helps. Uh, Lewis Husser and uh, that's your boy, huh? your son. Great. Billy Brenninger, John Abel, and Daniel Richardson, Cajun Navy. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Jim McInvale, known as the Mattress Mac. I met him early on in the campaign. Where's Jim? I met him early in the campaign. And I think you stayed with me, didn't you? Huh? You were right there, Jim. But I met him early. He liked me. I liked him. Mattress Mac. Great job you've done. Going to sell a lot of mattresses after today. And he knows, <laughs> he knows what he's doing, right? He knows what he's doing. Thank you very much, Jim, for being here. Uh, when Harvey struck, I will say this, Jim, Mattress Mac, opened the doors to his furniture store and provided food and shelter to hundreds and hundreds of people. And when the Astros made it to the World Series, he paid to send first responders of Hurricane Harvey to Game 6 in Los Angeles. And he's a real Texas guy, not just used in Texas, right? <laughs> and I want to thank every member of the Astros team who spent time with those displaced in shelters. You held food and supply drives all over Texas and beyond and gave millions and millions of dollars of your salaries. I know you're doing pretty damn well. You're going to be doing even better now. Where would I like to be? Can I be your agent? Huh? I, want to be, I want to be your agent. Look at Jim. He's, he doesn't find that funny at all. When Maria ravaged Puerto Rico weeks later, the Houston Astros redoubled their assistance. And many of them went there and helped. Really great. Our administration will continue to stand by the people of Texas and Florida and Puerto Rico, Louisiana, even Alabama and so many other places were affected. And we're standing by all of them. Texas was incredible, the way they recovered. You had a devastating, devastating hurricane. It kept going. I've never seen anything like it. It went in, and you thought it was gone, and it came out and got more water in, out, in, out three times. There's never been anything like it that we've seen. From the standpoint of water, not even close. There has never been anything so bad. And yet you recovered so incredibly well. I was there. I was there very shortly after. And some of the streets that were six feet high in water, you could hardly notice that they were affected. In one case, a man was actually cutting his lawn. I said, the lawn's pretty wet, isn't it? <laughs> he wanted to cut it. Anyway, oh, look who we have, Louis Gohmert. Louis, boy, I'll tell you, what a good congressman. What a great job. Thank you, Louis. Thank you for being here. The Astros' victory for the ages was truly a team effort, and that is true. Everyone contributed. Everyone made critical plays. Everybody helped deliver the championship. Very few errors on that team. The Astros have had an incredible progression in recent years. Not so long ago, I'd watch, I'm a big baseball fan, and 
the team was not a good team. Maybe it was a good team, but it wasn't doing very well. And what you did this year was incredible, putting it all together. And it's true testament, really a true testament, to the entire organization and to your many loyal fans. You have great fans. Texas is an amazing place. Great fans. It's tough stuff. Winning the World Series required years of effort, faith in your vision, and an unwavering will to succeed. And now, what happens a lot of times is you get a little complacent and bad things happen. I don't think that's going to happen to this team. There'll be no complacency, fellows. Just forget about last year, right? Just put it down as a great memory, but no complacency. How about George Springer, the most valuable player of the World Series? Where's George? Where's George? So let's see, George hit five homers. That's a lot of homers. During the Fall Classic, only the third player ever to do so in history. That's pretty great. Way to go, George. And who could forget the amazing Jose Altuve? Where's Jose? He's much taller than I thought. Unbelievable. That's a hell of a team. Congratulations, Jose. That's really what you've done is incredible. The American League MVP is a true fan favorite. He led his team in hits and set a new career high with a 346 batting average. 346. Wow. That's good. You know, I sat next to Stan Musial about 10 years ago before he passed away and he was doing the circuit. And I think he said he played for 22 years and his batting average was 333. And I said, and he was never the happiest person after me because he figured he missed out. But I'll tell you, what a great guy. Stay in the man, right? 22 years, 333 batting average, so that's good. But for this year, you beat him, right? That's great. <laughs> that's good. Do it for another 22 years. <laughs> He'll do it. Dallas Keuchel and Charlie Morton both won 14 games during the regular season, and they were tough. And Brad Peacock was very close behind. So, fellas, congratulations. Even two years from now is going to be...